And thank you for joining us in person and virtually for our artist talk centering the artists in our current exhibition, um, Five, which is a emerging artist exhibition. And for the first half of the talk, we will be talking with Diane Nielsen, Matthew Ramming, and Keith Thompson. So we're just going to jump right in. Uh, I want to ask you guys um, more of a philosophical question about why... Um, what is your why? Why did you start practicing? And how is that answer um, reflected in the work that's presented in this exhibition today? I'll start with the heavy questions. <laughs> um, so I would say that when I first started creating, it wasn't really like a thought out thing. It just was what I did. You know, I always wanted to be an artist. I didn't exactly know why that was. Um, but now, as an adult, I'm realizing that it is very much a way of healing and um, kind of learning more about myself, processing those things. And um, in my practice now, I've found that it's helping me to figure out, like, how to be a woman, if that makes sense. Like, um, how to heal, how to be a woman and love myself, and um, kind of also a way to speak to things that I see going on in the world around me. Um, and I like how you put it in your thing, so that it's coded in a coded way <laughs> that I can discuss it in like a safe way. Yeah. Me? <clears throat> I think that my why 
changes um, early on, I think that what attracted me to art first was the idea of artists, you know, and that there were these people out there who told the truth and who made things with their hands and who used both of those things, the truth and things they could make with their hand to influence their environments and to show the ways they were influenced by their environment. And I think that my work is always trying to be that as well as the work is like Daya said, you know, a kind of um, use it to sort out everything else, a kind of way, like a sieve through which you make sense of things. Um, and sometimes it works the opposite way as well. Uh, I don't know if that's, okay, so. For me, the work is usually difficult, you know, because my practice is strongly rooted in confrontation. And for me, the work is often a way that I can have confrontations and remain whole, you know? So I'm constantly pushing and pulling uh, all of the parameters of that because as my needs evolve, the work has to evolve. As the community's needs evolve, the work has to evolve again. So it's constantly that cyclical thing. Uh, my why? Um, well, I always, I guess, had a knack for drawing. So before I could write, it was sketching and drawing. And my entire life, that's just been like a side thing. I never really um, was too interested in um, art as a career. Um, religious background and all these different things kind of push me in a different direction. So when I first started uh, college, I was essentially supposed to be a law major. And um, I thought that was boring. I didn't want to wear a suit. So I told my mom that I would do um, art and she fully supported me in, in that. Because I mean, it was the only thing I did when I was in school, even though I had like uh, good grades, all I really did was draw all of my workbooks, uh, sketchbooks, and essentially it was something that I found that I was completely in love with, and it was the one thing that I saw that I could do for the rest of my life without being compensated or having to care about anything, because that was just the thing for me. So um, <clears throat> as it pertains to my practice, I put so much time into the technical side of my work that it none of the paintings to me are about the technical side of the work. Like, although every time I talk about the work, everybody's like, wow, this is really well painted. I, it doesn't matter to me. The thing that matters the most is the message in each one of the paintings. So because of my background and all of the things that I've like experienced in life, um, I use my paintings as a way to shine light on experiences that will not be spoken about publicly, either because of their, um, inability for people to be able to digest them or just I guess the the language of it all may be too harsh for people so um, for me art is a way to pretty much give myself the ability to understand what it is that I'm going through the ability to understand it from multiple perspectives and then try to build a conversation within my demographic and the demographics that don't understand my demographic so that it makes sense. So I use, pr pretty much this is a secret that no one knows, I use my technical skill to swing people into believing that <laughs> this is really great art, but really to force them to have conversations about what it is that I want them to have conversations about in reality. Thank you. Um, there seems to be a commonality between the three of you about using art as a vehicle for communication um, and introspection. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, the conversations that we had prior to uh, the exhibition and just for full transparency with everybody else. We've been talking about this show for 
over a year, maybe, um, in different conversations with different people um, about uh, just understanding what it means to cultivate a practice and, you know, not feeling heard, not feeling seen, trying to validate your work in spaces that, you know, um, it's, it's hard to receive validation. So I, 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 I would like to ask how has, um, because I grouped the three of you together for this talk because the longevity of your careers are different from Amani and Brent. So you've been doing this for quite some time. What has been the hardest thing to communicate about um, cultivating a practice, sustaining a practice, or just what difficulty have you found in communicating through your artwork in um, the Bahamas as a young artist? Would you like to go? I could go. The question, just to remind me again, is about com what is the challenges about communicating in an er as an emerging artist in this space? Um, for me personally, I think that one of my biggest challenges is getting people to understand that I have the ability to make a, a, a choice and that things that are happening in the work aren't happening haphazardly, and especially because having to explain that um, robs me of an interaction of communication. Uh, Can you describe to us uh, about the physicality of your work for people who you know, aren't familiar with your practice? So, my work is sculptural, right? Oftentimes, although my work is sculptural, the format that I present the work in is 2D, right? So, I apply sculptural rules to work that isn't necessarily presenting itself as sculpture. And this is because in my study of art, and Bahamian art in particular, all of my predecessors that I whose work I enjoy, their practices are like that as well. Um, form and function, uh, the lines are there, but they're at play. And I like that idea of like practice at play, even when the conversation is serious. And oftentimes, all of the steps that I'm taking intentionally, and because they're diverging and diverting and overlapping and um, coming back on themselves again. And because of my youth, they're not always things that I can fully f like articulate or articulate with the confidence in the moment to make people like shut up and get out of the way. So often I feel like things that I'm doing very intentionally and intensely and for storied reason, because like I, I said before, I'm following a canon of work and attempting to expand on that canon, uh, the physicality of which is like in the art history sphere, as well as I'm drawing um, from the environment to talk about physicality and stuff like that. So right, uh, if you go to Bahamar, um, they have a kind of Bahamas that it looks like, right? A kind of landscape go to Albany, there's a kind of landscape. Um, but when you go to Nassau, there's a kind of landscape. And I'm referencing my interactions with those spaces. And often that interaction is not um, frameable. So I feel like, although there's huge responsibility on me in that moment, because I'm the artist, I'm the one telling the story, I, the earnest is on me in some way to educate the viewer on what they're experiencing and how they're experiencing it. So there's all of this work that has to be done by me. But like you say, youth comes into it and there's passions and there's, wait, I, I, it's right now, I feel it right now. And I have to like guard the ego that allows me to make work and not prevent, make it prevent me from being able to communicate about the work and communicate in the work. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 
you are comfortable to listen. I was going to say, um, I do want you to answer the question, but I know that you and I particularly are painters, um, and painting has such a deep history and root, especially if you want to go back to like colonialism and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, ask the question, um, but also answer the question, but also um, bring it back to like describe your work as well for people who. Okay. Um. <laughs> Um, so for me, a big challenge in the work is trying to get my audience to understand what it is that I'm trying to say. Um, I feel like sometimes I may be too conceptual and sometimes I feel like I make work for artists and not make work for um, people that are not artists. So in a lot of ways, I try to simplify things in the work so that um, people that don't have as much art history, knowledge, and all of these things will be able to receive it in a way. So instead of using symbolism, I try to use emotion. <clears throat> and that is a, a challenge for me specifically, too, because I have to always think about, is this work palatable? And as of late in my practice, I have come to the conclusion that I, I probably don't care anymore if the work is palatable or not, because I feel as though what is being said is much more important than how is it going to be received, especially in this day and time where everything is received. However, a person with their specific background and perspective is going to take it anyway. So um, lately, well, especially in this um, group of works, I use direct symbolism so that it is um, easy to understand, but I feel like a lot of people won't, still won't get it um, from just looking at it. So if I may, can I explain the works? Okay, so if anyone has just seen the works for the first time, or just spoken to me about the works for the first time, my works are about um, the duality of feeling hyper-visible as a black man and artist, and invisible as a black man and artist in the art community. Um, I've worked at a lot of places, done a lot of traveling, and been in a lot of exhibition spaces. And as a black man, it feels like you are not seen in a respected light. Um, the way I see it is, like, I would walk through spaces, and the way I dress, it's obvious, it's, it's almost impossible to not be able to see me. Like, I am going to stand out in a room, but as a worker as a person that is making this thing a reality, I'm never seen in that light. I would always be seen as just a visitor into the space and not a cultivator of the space. So um, I made these works. They all have like black paintings in them to represent black artwork because when I walk through these spaces, I see a lot of Afrocentric work that is speaking about post-colonialism and speaking about all the things that have happened to black people over the space of time since then. And all of these conversations to me are being carried in the wrong way because they're carried by um, white galleries with white representatives trying to figure out ways to create these conversations for people of their demographic to understand when in a lot of ways these works are made specifically for, um, for colored people to be able to, to not only vent into, but to purify themselves into. So in these works, there are a lot of different symbols happening, but um, for all of the black people in the paintings, they are invisible. Um, they are just floating clothes because that's how I feel in these spaces. And because of that, I like this, the work itself, I had a whole different thought of imagery for the works that, and I thought that maybe if I did it this way, it would be much more receptive. But once again, I feel like stuff that I make goes over people's heads or I over conceptualize it. So that's like a super big challenge as a painter, especially as a painter that works from references. Um, how do you make something that is a uh, concise thought and um, is easy to go across all demographics? Okay, so I feel like I have the same issues um, or similar issues for when it comes to like 
symbolism and stuff and over conceptualizing because so for anybody who hasn't seen my work um i do more i don't know realistic surreal i don't know what to call it surrealism <laughs> yeah like surrealism where i'm i kind of think of it as a collage because i'm referencing a lot of different imagery when i create the pieces um to make it look like what i want it to look like so um i try to like not try but i just i like to use a lot of symbolism and i like to use a lot of metaphor and i think that a lot of the times it goes over people's heads and going back to the question of how like having difficulties in communicating i think that's a big thing for me is just trying to find a balance of when to be honest and when i'm allowed to hide and when to take symbols so one of the conversations we had recently was um this was a big thing for me recently was this ship um using the ship in my paintings before which to me had symbolized like depression and like not being grounded and moving um like at the whim of the ocean um which is not a symbolism for other people <laughs> And I kind of took that symbol and made it my own thing without explaining that to people who might be looking at the work, um, which obviously can create issues when people are looking at the work. They read something else into the piece. Um, so I think that that's something that has I need to be a little bit more mindful of in my pieces. Um, and then just like creating works that to me makes sense but i would also need to explain so like for example i have the piece over there which has the bottles that are faded has like the seahorse and stuff in it um and i think to a lot of people it's a pretty painting but to me it's it has a lot of um deeper things in it and some of it can be a bit dark which i don't really like to express too much um so like that piece is about death and dying and being stuck in this constructed environment and constructed narrative that somebody else places you in. And I think a lot of us go through that living in the Bahamas. Um, like we're all told like you need to do the tourism thing and like you need to be a certain way so that people can consume you. And when you go away and you go to a different country, you again, you're this thing that needs to be consumed. Like I was the Bahamian when I went to school and it just kind of like suffocates you and um yeah so like in the painting with the with the green parrot and the ants it's like one day death is gonna come when people are putting you in this place that you're not supposed to be um but yeah that's my point no it's okay thank you i think the something matthew said about youth and excitement and like temper and ego was really interesting and then um, I'm thinking a lot about uh, Keith and your explanation about the work and talking about being a black man and being um, invisible in a space where, you know, images of black men and black people and pr people of color specifically are being consumed widely, especially post um, George Floyd um, in the US and the consumption of black art at that level. Um, and I'm also like, I think sometimes we don't as, um, Caribbean people, depending on our background, have the right to opacity in our work. Um, Daya, this like ability to um, allow the work to be what it is and not have it be decipherable and not have it communicate and not have it be just like ingestible in a way. Um, so there's a lot to <laughs> mull over. Um, but I guess what I would like then um, to talk on before I open it to the audience is I know that it's I know that working here, um, trying to find your foot in, trying to figure out how much to say, um, question if you're saying too much, if you're not saying too much, trying to figure out um, what um, what is the right way. Like, do I do this or do I do that? Do I keep the job? Do I not keep the job? Um, I would ask, um, as an emerging artist, what support um, would you need to, um, yeah, continue to grow and to evolve and to like get your chafe in and, you know, but also be, um, 
you know, sues and bombs, like what support can you, what further support can you be given to um, help to cultivate your practice? Um, I think just having a community in general is really nice and having people that are just open and honest about your work, their work, how things are being read. Um, Cause I think that's something we can all work on. <laughs> um, and yeah, like just I don't know, having that community is very much needed and that's, that's yeah. <laughs> They say closed mouth don't get fed, right? So I would like a kiln. And I would also like a studio space, one where I could do my sculpture and then also do my printmaking and also do my painting. So if you're all writing it down. <laughs> um, but resources and access and time. Time with other artists who articulate in different ways and maybe have been articulating longer has been invaluable to my practice. And every time that I get more time with artists who are just doing what they want to do in the way that they want to do and trusting themselves and trusting the process, my practice jumps every time. Same thing with um, um, just being able to access space where there's already like a flow of art information. At the time I spent at the NAGB was huge because I know the canon now and I can like reference things in my mind just casually. I mean, we do it all the time as people in the arts, but people who haven't shared our experiences in those art spaces, they can't just casually reference that show that we, you know, saw pictures of or, or because it just, the contextualization and the historicization of um, me making up words of, of Bahamian art is not as thorough as we'd like it to be, even though it is very thorough, because I don't want to at all advance that as isn't. Um, so there are holes, but you get access to that information, and that information causes you to expand. And I would like more of all of those things. I want to see more artwork. I want to um, spend more time with artists who are making work and courageously making work and trying to expand what it is that we see. And I would like more money. <laughs> I don't know how to put that a nice way, but... <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Um, and something I wanted to, before we get to the audience, um, one of the feedbacks that I got about the exhibition was that the work was so different. Like everybody's practice was so different. Everybody's um, styles are so different. And we had conversations about this, um, the five of us, well, four and five of us before the exhibition. Um, but I think one of the things that, uh, one of the common threads within the work that we spoke about is this um, sort of succumbing to being a Bahamian artist or this like, that the Bahamas is a brand within itself. And in relation to that brand, you're either visible, invisible or hyper-visible. Um, and I know that, you know, a lot of the advice we get as young creatives is to kind of like break out of here and to um, establish a, a footing for ourselves and a, a space for ourselves outside of like the culture of it because it could be all consuming. Um, what has been your, um, relationship to that in regards to like the expectations of you as a Bahamian artist and what ways are you, if you are, and if you aren't, it's fine, um, actively thinking about moving, how how your work sits in relation to like this expectation of sun, sand, and sea, and tropicality, and all of that. I, I really want to make this very clear to all of the new and up and coming artists. Please make the work that you want to make. Very clear. I, when I first started making work, a lot of my work's references were, um, I'd say American, because I travel a lot. So a lot of the pictures and stuff, a lot of the things that I've experienced would be between home and here. And <clears throat> in some ways, certain things that happen in America 
much easier, like the imagery for the thing is much easy to cultivate the idea that you're trying to express than it is for it in the Bahamas if you don't have an example of that thing. So, um, although we are sun, sun, and sea, that does not, for a lot of us, represent our everyday life. There are a bunch of us that have never been, that haven't been to beach in years, that haven't picked up a conch shell probably ever in your life. Like, we, you are Bahamian. You're ba your artwork is Bahamian artwork because you were born in the Bahamas. The imagery does not ultimately have to connect to your Bahamianism. The thought and context of the thing should definitely connect to who you are because you don't want to have conversations about things that don't really concern you. But you could use your imagery in ways that are grounded in the place that you are in without it being of the place that you are in. So that's, that's just a, a thing that I wanted to, to say. Um, you can, as a, as a Bahamian brother, everything that you experience and all of the works that you create would have come from something that happened at some point in your life within the Bahamian context. So, although it's great to paint sun, sun, and sea, and I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I, 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 I thought, I thought, no, and also, no shit to, to all of the great artists out there that, that paint flamingos and conks and all of the things. We, we respect and appreciate you and your artwork. I have to say that. But I feel like sometimes there are, uh, especially for me, I would, you would never really see any of those things represented in my works because those are not the things of my area. They're not the things of my current life. I would much rather speak about things that are either a pressing issue to me or to a community of people that I feel and understand for. I think that in itself gives more value to your artwork. I feel like, and that's another thing too, people um, kind of try to put you in a box depending on your physical skill in the craft. Your, what it is in your mind is the most important thing. You could you have the your entire life like it's a marathon. You have your entire life to be able to get to the technical side that you want to, but it's best to work on your mind and what it is that you want to say and building that language in your head translate into your visual language moving forward. So passionate. <laughs> uh, okay, so. I personally, my thing lately has been that I need to just hold firm in what I'm creating and not let like other people's critiques get to me um, because I've been hearing like feedback and I'm like, oh, maybe I should change this in my work or change that in my work. And I don't want to, like, I really don't want to. And I don't see the need for it. Um, obviously, like if the critique is good, I'm gonna take it. But if it's doesn't, suit me then I'm just not going to take it anymore um but like going back on Bahamian versus breaking out of the typical Bahamian thing I would say that my work kind of plays into the typical um which I'm accepting like I I like it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna paint me some conch shells <laughs> and some flamingos and I'm gonna be happy about it um but I think that it's just important, like you said, to do what it is that you want to do and what you need to make and what you need to create. Because at the end of the day, like if you're creating things that you don't want to make, you might as well just stop. Like you, just, there's no point in making anymore. You just feel gross. Um, and like the opposite side of that, because I feel like we try to, well, some of us, not you guys, um, play into the Bahamian thing because you're like, oh, that's what's gonna sell. And then you want to break out of the Bahamas. And when you try to do that, then it's like, well, your work is too island life. Because I've had like curators in other parts of the world say that to me. And then that triggers something. Because then it's like, well, should I be creating work that isn't typical Bahamian scenes just to try to get into a different market? And again, like you have to create what it is that your soul feels like you need to create and not just constantly listen because there is a place for your work and there are people that are going to buy your work 
no matter what it is. Like you just need to find the right audience for it, stick to those people and kind of drown out everything else. I think for me, for me it's a, a little bit different. <clears throat> I think it kind of connects back to what drives the work and the question of why. Um, and because my why is very much attached to this space, my work is attached to this space. And even when I move away from representing myself with what is quote unquote sun, sand and sea visual language, I reference sun, sand and sea in the way that I'm painting or in my approach to it, or sometimes even in the inappropriateness of what I'm saying, because that's sun, sun, and sea as well. So I'm constantly trying to um, re-understand that for myself and challenge my, my own practice and, and say, am I using it? Am I doing it? Am I, um, so it's, it's constantly that push and pull and trying to, trying to see, all of those things as material more than as um, than as content or anything like that, and as a like the whole conversation about like chasing one thing directly, I think is ooh, stressful. That sounds stressful. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I would. Um, I would make work like you say that is moving me, but also. I don't, there's like a kind of ego that comes to the work and I'm trying to put that away and not listen to what I need only from the work also, but, but to receive the idea that this work is detrimental for somebody's existence because in some way that is true. And I feel like every good artist that I've ever experienced has in big and small ways advanced that part of it, if nothing else, and that's what I would like to do. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Concerns? Because I could go on. <laughs> questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> Just wanted to open up, open it up a bit. Oh, child, they mulling over y'all words. <laughs> the mullings. Um, I wanted to talk about the one thing that stood out to me too in this exhibition because I kind I left it kind of open ended um, in regards to what you can bring forth um, in the work. Um, my curatorial process is, you know growing as your practices are growing. Um, so this is more of a, like an experimental approach to it, but. Um, when we talk about like the Bahamian art history canon, uh, the work in here is predominantly two-dimensional. So I wanted to talk about, um, is there an interdisciplinary side to your practice? I'm thinking specifically about your work, Matthew, that is um, monotypes on paper, and there's this um, text like visceral texture to it. Um, can you speak to the yeah, the interdisciplinary side of your practice, do you, um, is there room for an exploration of like media in your practice? And I'm asking because all of our practices are still young. I don't foresee us to make the same work um, that we're making now, like five years, two years, maybe 10 years from now. So are you open to expanding where you are now or is this you? I'm planning the expansion actively. Um, I'm like if I'm sitting in painting now, I'm sketching in printmaking or sketching in sculpture. Um, and for me, the practices overlap and I use the different voices to say a different thing. The way like when you're on your way to church, you listen to a gospel song. And when you go into the job, you listen to a different kind of music. And if you have something to do, you, you know. So for me, the interdisciplinary um, approach is kind of like changing voices. Um, this work in particular, it was very important to do that um, because as my practice moves away from 
things that are more easily discussed with narrative and become more about theme and touching on an already existing narrative and expanding on that and trying to tie those things together to kind of shortcut the whole conversation. Um, I've had it to I've had to add other things to the practice. So when I want to talk about history um, as a way of like a kind of symbolism, I reference like artisanal kinds of work, right? So there's lots of weaving happening in this work because I've been doing my own historical um, unraveling of my own family history and that seemed appropriate, right? the works are prints of those woven works because in my brain that almost works like a photograph you know you have this thing that exists as the image but if you hold woven works in your hand they inhabit a very different space and i like um that duality and that difference and being able to go back and forth between the two things and also being able to have the woven sculptural works to inform the photograph. Um, it feels like it feels like I'm talking and saying two sentences at the same time. And um, we, I had this conversation with uh, my partner the other day, and I was like, you know, a lot of the times people say that my language is vague, but often the language isn't vague is that I'm intentionally leaving out words so that they don't distract you from the words that I really want to say. And in a painting with a thousand and seven brush strokes and all of them could cause somebody to look the wrong way, there's so many opportunities in which to do them. Um, I think that I'm taking pages from other artists that I like and so, I don't want to say because I'm making assumptions as well, but I feel like Schmidt does this sometimes in his practice. But um, to say I know Schmidt, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like sometimes I feel like sometimes in your practice, instead of saying um, I went down the road very very clearly and doing a very detailed picture of you going down the road you will reference seven different things that mean I went down the road in some format or another, an amalgamation or another. And I think that there are, like Schmidt, several artists um, who do this. Kendra Ferb's practice is, has breath in that way. Um, her symbolism is so intense it's almost like even though you're involved in it and it's happening so often and it's reoccurring so often and you know what you're expecting, there's still something intensely secret about it because just because of how many voices and how it's almost like the symbolism is disorienting because you got the, you got the scarlet plums, you got the sugar apple, you got bananas, then it's the banana as the sucker and the banana as the fruit and then it's banana this color and then it's the straw bag, and then it's this straw bag, and it's the next straw bag. So there's constantly that doubling back on itself. And I think um, we see this in the earlier work in like Jackson Burnside and Stan Burnside's cubism and all of that. There's this um, story and the story and the story and the story. And I think that in my practice, the way that I'm trying to do that is with the material and with the technique, and sometimes with the like literal visual content, but often because what I want to say is so sharp, I like to leave it a little bit more stripped down than people who went the cubistic route. And because what I want to say is so sharp, I like to leave a little bit more information than some people who go even more stripped down than I do. That was beautiful. Yes. Um, one more time for questions, because we soon wrap up the segment. Okay. Sorry, this is for, I guess, all three. Should I stand? 
Okay, um, for all three artists, thank you. This is very exciting. I got goosebumps. You guys are very articulate. It's, it's, it's fan fantastic. Anyway, um, for all three artists, I think, Matthew, at the beginning, you were saying something like you were approaching, and I'm sorry if this is getting philosophical, you were like reaching for a certain truth or attempting to reach for a certain truth like in the process of making your work and just picking off of what all of you were kind of saying, like there seems to be like this overarching like reach for something. Um, I'm sorry if I'm gonna make you repeat yourself, but I was wondering if you could just like define that a little bit more concisely. Um, just all around, I, I'd be curious to hear it, thank you. Sorry, it's been forever since I've held the mic. Um, no, it, it seems like you like the work is very different. Let me rephrase it this way: um, going off of what Jody was saying at the beginning, like um, as well, like the work is very different in the exhibition, um, and it seems like you have very definitive thoughts about your practices, which lead me to believe like you're reaching for something. If there's something that you may have missed saying earlier, like if you could, you know, touch on that, there seems to be like a reach towards something. Like what, what would that be? Not to be too abstract. No, I mean for you, how you work. I'm talking about process. Like what is it that just drives the next project? Like what is the reaching for? I know it's having, you said like it's being understood, but I think I'm curious if there is like another layer to that or like not even above it or, or underneath that. Okay, um, so for me, I, I, at first I didn't have like, a, apparently I've, I've gone down this activist route, didn't want this for me, um, tried to avoid it, could not, here I am, um, but essentially my goal is to just continue to have conversations or force uncomfortable conversations between um, different demographics, if that's the easiest way to say it. Um, every, every work that I plan to make will have in some way a connection to something that I see as a problem that isn't being said or it's being said and being said down, said in a watered way so that people don't really understand. Because it's where I, I try to have conversations with people, like especially from like the works of my past, so like the Crips and Bloods work and all the gang banging and people dying and all that stuff. Like, it was extremely difficult to have that conversation with people that were from, Al from Albany or Life of Key because they were like, what is this? What is going on? This, this isn't what happens in the country. And I'm like, that's because you live in these different places where life is so, it's, yeah, it's so different. Like, you, you never would have the experience gunshots at 10 o'clock in, in the evening while you're watching, like, Family Feud or anything like that. You will never really get to be in that situation. So it's almost like a tree fall, the tree falling thing. Like, do you hear it if it fell, if it wasn't, if you weren't around? So all of my works, literally from I've been in college now, which seems so far away, um, <laughs> has been about in some way, shape or form, furthering conversations that just seem to not get any light. So I don't know how long that's gonna last. Maybe it might just be for my, my youth. And when I get older, I just be like, you know what, this world is trash. I'm just going to not do that anymore and move on. But for right now, that's, that's pretty much what it is. Okay, do your thing. Hey, I could repeat the question. Um, this question is for you, Keith. Um, so again, I know some of your work, but I don't know it extensively but you mentioned Crips and Bloods, and I'm kind of curious to try to figure out why that, for one, okay. but also what gives you the authority to speak about that, for two. Because I think oftentimes when we, actually, no, let me let, I'll let you just answer the question, actually. So remember early uh, in the thing I was talking about, using American references to create 
um, conversations in a Bahamian context. This was one of them that failed terribly. So this, <laughs> yeah, essentially I had been, I had just come off of working on the Black Panthers movement and how they, um, there was like two sides of the thing, like the Fred Hampton side or the, Mon the MLK side where you get pretty much choose which path you want, but you was fighting for the same, for the same outcome. So after coming from that work, I went into work that was supposed to be speaking about the way we handled politics in this country. And I relayed um, the riots that had it was a, a time period where riots were happening and the Crips and Bloods were teaming up together as to say, we are black, we are not this thing that has been literally black against black killing each other for forever, which is like a crazy cluster within itself. But um, I use that as a way to bring it into a bohemian context as like, if my mother's a PLP, more than likely I'm gonna be a PLP. Or if my dad is an FNM and I like my dad, more than likely I'm gonna be an FNM. And it doesn't matter what they're bringing to the table for me as a bohemian, it only matters for the color that they represent. So in a lot of ways, I looked at gangs the same ways that I looked at politics in the Bahamas. No one got it, literally. Not a single person that talked to me about that work was like, this makes sense. They was like, this is, this is nice. This is good painting, buddy. You did great. But um, yeah, so essentially, I, I only spoke about them as a way to, to try to, it, for me, they represented colors. The symbol for them were colors. The symbol for me were colors. And yeah. So the second, now that I've answered, I'm gonna let you. So, okay, so this experimentation that went wrong, have you traveled to those places and been in those spaces with these people to speak about these people? For you have not, no? And why not the gangs here as opposed to the gangs in America? Okay, so there's it's two sides to this thing. One, the imagery was already available. So this, this is, yeah, this is young Keith here taking full, full accountability for the foolishness that he was doing at the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I made those works because it was easy to get imagery and I thought it would connect um, much easier. Also, how do I not incriminate myself? Um, Gangs hail. This is being broadcast. Yes, I am taking that into super consideration. So, <laughs> the 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 gangs hail. Um, one, I feel like it's easier to connect. Like people know Crips and Bloods more than the the gangs hail. Like I could call off twenty gangs right now, and you probably only know three of them. They have no real imagery to represent them. So if I was to make these. If, if I was to make the same work then using Bahamian gangs, it would be almost impossible to understand what it was that I was talking about. So I used that as a way because it was just red and blue. Everyone knew that red is blood, blue is crypt, and no matter where in the world that work was out at the time, it would still translate as bloods and grips. As if it was a Bahamian gang like the DPG or like fire boys or something, fire and tear or something, they'd be like, what is this? If, if I was to put that in like an Atlanta or, <laughs> or Europe or anything, you understand um, what I mean. But yeah, so I tried to make it easier for people to understand, but it, it, it obviously wasn't that much. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, going back to the question about reaching. Um, Totally, totally different topic. Um, but for me, I think, like you said, how your why changes. I think my why has been changing constantly for the last couple years, just trying to like figure out who I am, figure out who I am as an artist. And um, I think when I say that I really started to get into my artwork at the beginning of it, it was like, how do I make this a commercial thing? How do I, you know, how do I make money off of this? And then it turned into, how do I explore who I am through this? And at the time I was like dealing with 
a lot of mental health issues and I had like horrible anxiety, horrible depression, um, was dealing with like suicidal thoughts and all that stuff. Um, and the artwork kind of helped with that. And it's still something that I'm going through and, but it's more of a lens of like, I've always painted women, but now I'm very much thinking about like who I am as a woman and like, how am I as a woman spiritually or, um, you know, physically and all of that stuff that comes into it. So I think that like this work was made for this exhibition. Um, and I don't think that that would be something that I would explore anymore because I feel like I've had the conversation and I've really appreciated like having the space to have those conversations about like, you know, what does it mean to be a white Bahamian? What does it mean to, um, I don't know, like just be in the space with all everybody's different experiences. Um, but I kind of, my my new reach would be exploring what it means to be a woman and that sort of healing that comes into it and the empowerment of that. So I think that's my new why that I want to explore after the show. So <clears throat> I think I am reaching for I'm reaching for a way in which I could communicate correctly, like, and it's safe. Like, I do it, and you look at it, and you'd be like, wow, that was, yeah. I, I feel like, and like, I don't know, maybe like a kind of, I want powers from it, you know? I want to be able to put my hand in the mud and take out a sculpture, and it resonates, and I feel like, I have to make more work to do that. I have to renegotiate how I'm articulating myself to do that. Um, I have to re-explore what the work means for other people to do that. Uh, I have to constantly be, and it's the only way that's only in front of me. So I, I have to reach towards it. Thank you. It was lovely. Now I'm going to ask you guys to join the audience and ask Brent and Amani to come forward. It don't matter. It don't matter. It's y'all. All right. Hello. All right. So now for our second half of the of the talk, um, we're going to be speaking with Amani Hepburn and Brent Fox. I wanted to pair you guys together um, because I feel like there's so much in regards to um, cultivating a practice, and um, selfishly, Amani and I have very similar um, trajectories in regards to, um, we both went to the College of the Bahamas, we both, Amani works as a gallery assistant at the National Art Gallery now, I worked as a gallery assistant at the National Art Gallery, and I'm very interested in um, hearing about that in relation to your practice, but uh, I wanted to start off um, talking to Brent, because you have the youngest practice out of everybody here, um, can you tell us a bit about like the timeline in regards to like the timeline, your why, why did you start um, and what your journey has been um, up to this point? Hello. Hi. 
Um, so I've always been doing art since I was a kid. Um, so, but I just put it aside as like a hobby, I guess. And when I graduated high school, I just, you know, started working and I didn't have any, any ideas or I guess ambitions about college. So I think it took me working like a hotel job for three and a half years and like doing photography at the same time. That's kind of how I entered the art community and I started to build relationships in that way. So when people would see my stuff, they'd be like, why are you working at this hotel? You're actually really good, you know? And then over time, it was like, they kind of right? <laughs> and it was getting really stressful dealing with tourism. So I made the bold decision um, in December of last year to resign. And so I've been doing art full time since January this year. So still pretty new into it. Um, I really did it because I didn't want to have it on the back burner anymore and have have it feel like I was wasting my talent and slaving away at this job until I died, you know? So I, I felt like that made sense. And yeah, I've been working with that ever since. It's just experimenting with new things, trying to feel out what's right, which route I should take. If I'll, I guess, please a certain audience, I'm trying to project ideas towards and um, that's my why so far, yeah. Same for you, Manny, with your why? And how is that reflected in the work that you have here? I think I always get the question of like, why do I make work? Cause like, uh, I think as a, I don't come from like a family that is like, they're, they're the career is like focused in the arts, it's more so focused in either acad oh, academia or um, like engineering, stuff like that. So it was an interesting jump when I had, you know, I was transitioning out of high school, I was going to head towards college as to like how, what, what program I should go into because like I spent a lot of time um, as, as like a teenager, like really interested in the arts and seeing how I could be, how I could like develop that with myself. I didn't really have a lot of access to um, like art programs or anything like that. I was like a homeschool child. Um, but when I was transitioning you know, from, you know, from high school to university, um, it was actually like my mother who really, who like she saw my, she saw my like application paper and she was just like, why do you have accounting on this? And she's an accountant, like both my parents are accountants. She's like, why do you have accounting on this? Like, I'm like, because that's what I want to do. She's like, no, <laughs> I don't like art, like change it to art. And, I, and that's how that kind of like started in that ass. <laughs> I would have been an accountant. <laughs> Genuinely. Um, and then it just kind of like started from there because I think, at least for me, it was very interesting experience like transitioning from like just being homeschooled, kind of like trying to find things on my own terms and then being able to enter uh, a more institutional space that you know has like structured classes and also what I find most important is access to peers who are interested in the work as well as lecturers and teachers who are heavily invested in uh, cultivating your practice and your ability to interact with the work. Um, so for me as to why I think is to stay curious. I, I really I think in anything that I do or I interact with in the artwork, um, I just stay curious. I, I don't think I'll stop making work if I'm continuously trying to interact with the things around me or the um, people around me or even like the community that the communities that I interact with. I think as long as they stay curious, I think that's my why. Okay. Great wise. Um, both of you, um, well, Rani, you just talked about like the importance of like community and being in a space where um, there's like a flow of ideas, there's a flow of energy that helps to like 
you know, keeping this practice afloat. Brian, I know that you work at Project ICE. You have a studio there, um, and it's literally an incubator. <laughs> um, there's a few artists, um, like Keith as well, who work out of that space. Can you talk to, um, you know, having this curiosity, wanting to expand on your talents, um, having a, a studio space, how that has been, um, I wouldn't say inspiring, but how that's helped to cultivate your practice, being a project guys, having access to resources and so on. Um, so um, I had actually, I used to go to um, Antonius Roberts, like our pro programs during the summer before. So, oh, it was like at Hillside. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember you. So for context, <laughs> for context, the Ministry of Youth Sports and Culture puts on a annual summer art program and it was hosted at Hillside House for a few um, years and that's what Brent is referring to. You see how I get no taller, right? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, I already had met um, Mr. Roberts and I felt like that was a really great experience. So. When I found out about the starting of the project at ICE, um, I was like, okay, this is familiar. And then I already had um, connections to it through Reagan. And so I just ended up appearing there, I think before I actually quit my job. So everything was still in the works and I it didn't really, everything was being renovated still so I, I wouldn't, have known that it would have turned into a space that I would end up working in. Um, so initially she was one of the um, original artists in residence and now there's like a whole group of us. So going from that point to now where we actually all have individual spaces to work in free of charge is insane to me because I wouldn't be making the work that I am making without that space because you know like home is cramped up and you don't want to get pain on everything and all that. So I'm definitely grateful for that. Um, and that's helped me experiment more with different materials like this work here. I never used charcoal before this year or oil paint. So yeah, I'd be trying. Okay. Um, so, where was I? Yeah, so a lot of this work really was just experimental at first, and I didn't expect it to be hanging here in turn. Um, can't complain though, looks pretty nice. Uh, but yeah, definitely, um, at least with my uh, relationship with Mr. Roberts, it's, it's grown into this now, and he's very proud of the things that we accomplish every day at ICE. And even like take an initiative to do small things like I just um I just I'd be doing like little construction stuff around there and he it like gets really excited and appreciative that we actually wanna take this broken down space and turn it into something that could like be fixed up and utilized in the future for different purposes. So yeah. That's that's what ICE is like. Thank you. And Amani, I know that, um, like I said, you're the gallery assistant at the National Art Gallery. And something that a lot of people don't really take into full account is that most of the people who work at these art spaces or these institutional spaces have visual arts practices of their own. So how is it to be in community with persons um, who are balanced in both acts? And I think you also... Um, are a, a studio assistant to other artists as well. Can you talk about how that's been um, rewarding for your practice? Well, um, I'm gonna address things as I remember them. So the first, the last thing you say is the first thing I'll mention. I think, um, because I've been very fortunate, I would say that I've been able to do a bit of studio assistantship for you know artists like Sidney Covey and also like, especially like Tessa Whitehead. Um, I find that those interactions are like where the practice is really made and really learned. Um, because I've, 
well, I would say to Tesla, because I've like worked for, with her for a longer time, I would say that I've been influenced much, much more. But even with uh, Sydney, whose work is very, very different from the way that I practice, um, some, this, I don't know, there's just something about working within an artist space and being in that somewhat intimate area and being witness to their practice and how they um, confidently move through it or not so, or like na uh, and navigate that, it is immeasurable like how beneficial that is to like a young artist who is just, who gets to see how the work is made and how it actually gets from point A to point B and then to also be a part of that. I can't, I can't like express like how beneficial that has been and how privileged that I am to be able to interact on that level with um, person's practices. Um, and then the second thing that I think you mentioned with at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas is it's it's similar in that aspect. You you are able to learn about essentially the back working of the work that you interact with and the value of it outside of this is an image or this is a visual representation of something, but more so how, how to handle it and how to interact with it and also the understandings and information around it because you're, you're in the data with like a lot of information and you're expected to uh, manage a lot of information at the same time as well. Um, and I think sometimes I don't realize how much that also influences because then you're all, it's in some way or other aspect, it's like interacting with somebody's practice um, from an outside perspective. You're, you're privy to something that as a viewer, if you had never like been in those, like essentially the backstage and the, um, the other rooms, you're never privy to and you don't get a, I feel like that I have a fuller um, appreciation for that process and for what it takes to get, get the whole way through, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you see other pea soup and dumpling being cooked and <laughs> you get to, you know, develop recipes on your own because of that, yeah. Um, I think what is um, beautiful, I think, a central theme just now was mentorship. So you talk about um, Mr. Roberts and his contributions um, and his influence on your practice just by creating space and interacting with you. And you talk about Tessa and Tessa and Sydney allowing you in their studios and also like giving information. Um, I would like to ask um, more so about the kind of the drive, like the undercurrent, like the wave that keeps things going. Because I know when you're starting out with something, and I know Brent, you said that you didn't go to college for art specifically. How then do you cultivate? How then do you understand what it means to develop a practice? What kind of parameters do you set for yourself? Do you have rules? You know, or is there kind of like a a marker, a setup, sort of like goals that you want to reach to um, kind of sustain yourself. And in the same way, Amani, I would ask being someone who did go to UB, who kind of understands now um, the more formal aspects of it. Like, are there any um, goals or rules or parameters that you give yourself? Brenda, we'll start. That's a tropical question. That's OK. Um, so yeah, without having exactly technical knowledge of going to UB and knowing the ins and outs of how things should be set up. I definitely struggle with um, technical aspects or like knowing how to present an idea visually. So that's why um, I definitely try to take as much time to, I guess, conversate with mentors like Keith is really helpful in terms of when I'm trying to translate an idea because um, I don't have that knowledge of going to school. I did take courses for graphic design, but that was in terms of photography. Um, and like I said, I always um, drew or painted. Um, when I was a kid, I would do like, I like I would draw all day instead of doing my schoolwork. 
which was bad, but <laughs> um, yeah, so um, everything really at this point now is just experimental. I don't know. Um, I definitely want to um, try, try to develop more in the charcoal area. Um, and I always worry about if I'm laying on oil paint too thick or too thin or like I obsess about my signature. You know, it's it's <laughs> it, it's it's a lot to worry about, and I try not to go crazy thinking about if people like my stuff. I obviously still want to make coherent work that isn't really confusing and it's it's consistent in a way. So I'm still dealing with that now, like lacking that knowledge of, I guess, fine art and everything that has to deal with all that. Um, I would say as far as like keeping, you know, keeping things going, keeping drive, it's sometimes it's tough. <laughs> I think after I graduated, that's when I was 19. And that was like the year before the pandemic. I had like a, I would say six month, seven month period where um, I didn't really make much work at all. I think my practice slowed down to like maybe one painting a year. To be honest, this is the most paintings I've made in the last three years, like just for this show. <laughs> I'd like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> it's so, it, as far as like making the, the physical manifestation, um, I have like slowed down like immensely. Um, however, how I keep the practice going is I'm always interacting with the material that I'm inspired by and that um, keeps me curious in making the work. So I do a lot of like photography. I do, I'll actually do a lot of writing. So I'm like really into poetry. I've been really, you know, I think it's important like if, if you're making artwork to find ways to uh, develop the visual language outside of just, okay, I found a reference and I'm gonna draw that thing. I want, the first thing I want, cause like, as far as like the work that I made for the show now, it's a lot of it is investigating um, communal spaces and you know, environments that are very intimate to me. So like a lot of it, I find like decaying objects in the landscape that are especially that are put by persons or persons around me or myself to be very interesting. And also I wanna, in a, in a sense, memorialize them. Um, trying to find my thought. In a sense, I wanna try to memorialize them. And so I spend a lot of time just either looking at them, photographing them, or writing about the situations of the persons um, that they are involved with. For example, like, um, the, I have a painting of two chairs underneath this tree trunk, two, uh, tree trunks and a gate behind it. Um, it's like labeled, like all my title, all my titles are also connected with the work. So they're like min miniature poetry. So this, uh, these two chairs um, are, it's labeled seated under daddy's pear tree, I think number one. Um, and it's like a representation of like my father and thinking about these objects he's placed in the yard, the longevity that they've been there, and also the amount that they have decayed. But no matter how long that they are, have gone, or how long they've been there, or how far they look to be, they're still there, and they still hold space, and they're still used. And to me, I can see, it's almost like a portraiture of him through that. Um, so I spend a lot of time like investigating that part of it. Um, so if I'm not making the work, I'm photographing and I'm writing and, and or I'm just living the life so that you can actually make the work because you can't make the work if you don't have anything to reference from. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, uh, it was beautiful. Um, in the line of beauty, I asked, um, Matthew, though, is about the difficulties and the challenges of like creating a practice. But I want to ask you guys what has been the the sweet parts about it, the 
the parts that make you smile and you know get you excited to go back to the studio the next day or the conversations that you've had about the work that you know expanded your idea of art and then like you went to space and then came back to earth and then like wanted to create again what can you share a bit about those moments um if they happened um <laughs> with us Um, I think every time I make work now, it's always an interesting interaction between um, either my family or like my community, uh, because you know, like in the Bahamas, the Muslim community is tiny. Um, but and I, but my um, parents were involved, like kind of the founding, so I spent a lot of time there, um, and it's a very interesting pool of people because. Because the community is so tiny, you have people from essentially all walks of life, all um, a lot of um, differences of actual cultural backgrounds and stuff kind of amalgamating together. Um, so it's a uh, it's interesting when people either get what you're doing or you, they don't get what you're doing because you might be the only one who's doing it. So when I think I definitely know in our community, like I'm one of two artists, one who's much older than me. And then, so when I was younger, I didn't really have much in that way. But it's interesting now as an adult, um, with, you know, a burgeoning, you know, is it say burgeoning career? Yeah. <laughs> Emerging. Um, to re-interact with people um, in a very, there's a very, um, how do you say? There's almost an innocence to it when when people reinteract with you because they they're very curious or they see something they see themselves within it or see something very familiar within it and you're able to connect on that even though maybe like earlier um like earlier we, we may not have been able to connect fully on that level but um now we're they're able to connect with me in the way that i can connect with them and it's it's very it's it's very innocent. It's very beautiful in that way. Um, also, my mom, <laughs> she never asks for anything. She she doesn't she doesn't ask for anything at all. Um, but after I had um, painted this body of work, um, she came to me she, and she's like from Malaysia. She's she was she's been here for like thirty plus years. Like last time she went home, before she had gone home recently, was about twenty years. Um, so she came to me and she never asked her anything. She's just like, I want you to paint my grandmother's home in the Kampong, which is the village in, um, in, in Malaysia. Um, and <laughs> to me, that's beautiful. That's very, very innocent in that way. I want you to paint my grandmother's home. That's very sweet. Um, my family background was a bit more intense. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to be bleak, but, um, so art definitely never seemed like a feasible income to me. I love doing it, and my parents are definitely supportive of me painting and doing what I love, but definitely on the other side of it, it's like, what is this going to bring for you in the future? You can't really make this you know, a practical decision that you're gonna make. Well, specifically my mother, um, which is unfortunate because at the end of the day, bills do have to be paid. And me sitting around all day painting, kind of like, are we trying to live the life? So that's a hard decision for me to make, but I definitely do enjoy it. Um, even just, conceptualizing a new idea and figuring out how to translate it properly to where the idea doesn't get misconstrued. That's a big thing for me because you don't want to make work that confuses people. And being new to the practice, I, I'm cautious of that. I still am going to make that mistake at some point. I probably already have. Um, yeah, um, what makes me happy about it is 
knowing that I guess I get to have the opportunity to make art. And I do have so much support of people around me, even during exhibitions. Um, people will notice things in my paintings that I didn't even notice, you know, that I painted. They'll talk about like technique and colors. And I was, I just be slapping that on, you know, sometimes. And yeah, it's like it's, sometimes it's be like a, a lot of lotion into. Um, I'm like, gee, I, I just trying. So I, 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 <laughs> I think stuff like that is really cool. And uh, like I did mention before, I, like how I started this year, it was really like a, a race to see, okay, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna get good at? What can I experiment with? Cause you know, money. And that obviously shouldn't be solely the drive, but it definitely was in the back of my mind. So that's why everything is experimental for me to be able to figure out what people take to, what am I good at, what should I put down and probably not focus on as much. And I definitely realized recently that I shouldn't try so hard to like dumb down an idea for people or like just paint like super realistic things or like try to explore painting loosely, um, working with different colors, which was hard because I primarily like earth tones. So I absolutely despise the color red, but I feel like for this, it, it really worked and it made me happy. Um, so yeah, uh, that about sums it up. Thank you. I'm gonna open it to the floor now. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to ask about like time. So so Brent, I got I got a chance to see you in um, work in Toronto. I think a couple of weeks ago now, and I think you're like ferociously experimenting, trying to you know see what sticks, uh, which I think is smart. Like that's how, um, especially that your practice, you got the confidence to move forward. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to ask um, Amani though. Like there seems to be like a, like a, a a lot of trust in patience and time, which I'm I'm always surprised about because you you know you're so young and usually you just you want to kind of get it done and you have a very it seems like a very methodical way of working. Like I could look at the work and kind of align it in the history of landscape painting, for example. But at the same time, they seem very metaphorical um, in terms of like you know that those spaces seem lived in. Um, they seem familiar to you. They don't seem like downloaded images. Um, and I think like that requires a lot of like patience and it seems like, you know, like they have an interaction to them. So I just was curious, like for you, like, how do you, how do you kind of, um, use that as an ingredient, like patient, is it, or am I projecting on it is like patience or you just like, are you just working ferociously and editing down or are you just living with the work very slowly and where does that come from? I think for the work, um, you're not wrong. It does, everything kind of sits in the studio for like about a year. <laughs> or I'll take, I, cause like I know definitely for, let me see. Yeah, all three of these. Sorry, not three of these. The collection of work here, um, I've been like photograph, cause the, all these spaces that I've like um, depicted in these works are spaces are the, that are intimately familiar with me or familiar with people that I know. So they originate from some point of me visiting the space or um, interacting with it at some point. Um, so I'll usually take references about maybe two to three years ahead of actually creating the work. And I'll sit with it and I'll draw it and I'll think about it in that manner. I'll write about it. I'll I spend a, I spend a lot, I realize I spend a lot of time kind of just mulling over it. The actual painting process maybe takes about a month or so. That's the thing, it takes about a month. I think I, outside of the chair painting, yeah, outside of the chair painting, I think I'll, and the little wash machine, 
all these were finished within the, like the last couple of months before the show opened, like physically created. Um, but the actual work prior to that is over like a long period of time of me take, taking photographs, sitting with what is present, what I, to speed up the process in quotations, um, I always use my phone. I, I, don't, I, I've stopped, I used to have a camera, I used to take pictures of my camera. I don't do that anymore. I just use my phone. So whenever I see something, I, I wanna capture it, I wanna interact with it, I, I take the picture immediately and then I'll sit with it for a while. I'll print it out. I'll, put it, I'll keep it on my phone, I'll print it out. I, I have like folders and folders of like pictures, um, but they're not random. They're like, they're, there's always intention behind it. There's always a moment of interaction. So it takes, takes a minute. Oh, I thought it was mainly for, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I do work ferociously. It's kind of like a joke at ice at this point where I kind of paint too fast. Um, technical wise, it, like the painting will still be sound and proportionate to what I'm referencing, but um, I'll knock a painting out in like, like a sizable painting, like a like 16 by 20, I'll knock it out in like a few days. Um, charcoal work, definitely, I'll finish that in like a few hours, if it, even if it's a big piece. So I think, yeah, in terms of experimentation, I definitely freak myself out a lot. But it's really just because I feel like I have to move with purpose because I guess the more work that I make, the more that I can choose from, the more exhibitions can come from that. And then, like I said, at the end of the day, more income. There was a question online that asks if you could expand more on what you mean by not making people, making work that confuses people. <laughs> hmm. Okay, um, I guess I could be brought into like a, a lot of different things, especially that I make. Like this collage here was, um, it may seem confusing, I and mean, I could understand why. Uh, it's a lot going on, just as an example. Um, so I felt like even like weeks and months after creating it, I was still finding new things that I hadn't noticed about it before um, that could be interpreted and maybe other people may see something else. But I guess the general idea of it was to be cluttered and to have a lot going on in a space, especially given the name of the piece, um, which is uh, Drunken Hot Girls. <laughs> so yeah, um, I guess that's given a vibe of like, I guess being in a party space and a lot being like going on and um, people like tripping and and a lot of emotions, a lot of things being felt. Um, so that wasn't a, it, that wasn't even initially what um, I had made the piece for, but that's just how it ended up happening because they were all different drawings that I kind of pasted together. So. I think sometimes I work like that, going into an idea and it's strong and I know what I want to communicate and then other things are just like, let's see what works. And people ended up liking this one, even though I, like I said, slapped it together. So. <laughs> what? <laughs> There is intention behind your collaging of the work together, okay? You didn't slap it together. <laughs> is there any more questions from the audience? No? Okay. Well, 
I think that this is a very good note to end on. Thank you all, all five of you, for your time and your generosity about talking about your practice. I greatly appreciate it. Um, the exhibition comes down August 27th, so if you haven't seen it yet, you still have time to come and see it. We are open Tuesday through Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Mondays by appointment. So thank you all once again. You can follow us on Instagram at Turn Gallery. Like the video on YouTube. Um, yeah, and then we'll be opening a new exhibition on September 5th, which is a solo exhibition by Blue Curry. 15th, that. <laughs> September 15th by Blue Curry. And I think that's all the announcements for tonight. <laughs> all right, thank you guys.